Hey, hey, welcome back everyone to another broadcast of In the Trenches. I'm really excited today to sit down with Sean Askinosi. Sean is the founder of Askinosi Chocolate, a small batch bean to bar chocolate manufacturer located in Springfield, Missouri, which sources 100% of their beans directly from farmers around the world. He's also the author of Meaningful Work. In today's conversation, Sean gives us a look behind the scenes of his business, how he started it, going from trial lawyer to chocolatier and the ups and downs of what that process was like how Sean has been able to expand operations profitably. And we talk about meaningful work and what meaningful work is to Sean and how he approaches this idea of vocation and what gives him the drive and the passion to continue to do what he does, even though it can be really, really difficult. One of my major takeaways from today's conversation is Sean's approach to business and this idea of reverse scale. And fundamentally, how do we build a business where scaling isn't the point or doesn't have to be the point, that we're not trying to chase every single dollar? Can we build a profitable business that aligns with your ethics, your morals, what you care about in life, and can be profitable for you, good for you, your family, your employees, and the broader community without having to scale and to try to find that exit per se? So I definitely had a lot of fun on today's conversation. Uh, it went some directions I didn't expect it to go, but I thought the conversation about faith and that intersection between faith and work and the work we do, this idea of vocation and meaningful work, it was a reinvigorating conversation to say the least. And my hope is that you get as much value out of it as I did. So without further ado, let's get to today's conversation. So Sean, I want to kick things off by getting a little bit of your background. How did you get into the world of chocolate and chocolate making? You know, I got to the craft chocolate world the way most people did. I was a criminal defense lawyer for 20 years, specializing in serious felony cases and murder cases. And after 20 years, I decided I needed to do something else. And I spent five years aimlessly adrift in an infinite void looking for the next thing. And here I am, chocolate. Been doing it for about 12 years. Why did chocolate get your attention uh, versus, I don't know, coffee or tea or uh, outside of even even consumables like any anything else like I'm curious why chocolate that is a really good question I did not have a sort of lifelong dream to have anything to do with chocolate and I of course consumed it the way most people do but when on my search I decided it would be a good idea to have some hobbies and in the first 20 years of my professional life my work was my hobby I love the courtroom and preparing for the courtroom. So my first hobby was grilling. And I bought a big green egg. And then I bought another big green egg, because you know, you need two. And then I switched from that to baking. And I made thousands of cupcakes. And I thought that that might be in my future. And then I started making chocolate desserts. And then one day, uh, almost a light bulb moment, I was driving to a funeral of a distant relative. And I just got this idea, hey, what if I make chocolate from scratch, had no clue what that meant. I didn't know where it came from. I thought it was like a chemical substance that just was melted or something. Anyway, within three months of that light bulb, I was in the Amazon uh, studying how farmers can influence the flavor of chocolate by how they harvest the cocoa beans. What was that conversation like with your wife and family when you just flew off to the Amazon to go do that? <laughs> I'm curious. <laughs> well, that part of the conversation was fine and not a problem. But the part of the conversation when I came back from the Amazon and said to my wife, I'm going to throw away a perfectly good law career where I'm making a ton of money and really reaching the peak of my career. And I'm going to give that up for a business that no one is doing in the United States right now, really. That was a tough conversation. You know, I had gone through, as you can imagine, during that five-year period of searching, a lot of depression and anxiety the way I'm sure some or many of your listeners may have experienced in some form or another during this search. And she asked me, and she's okay with me repeating this, by the way, she, she asked me, Sean, can't you just double up on your Lexapro? And I tried to explain to her that SSRIs, antidepressants don't work that way. <laughs> if, if you're on 20 uh, milligrams, 40 doesn't make you happier and not want to quit your job. So that's the way that conversation went. 
And so but we're still uh, married, still married 30, yeah. 31 years. That's awesome. Congratulations. So this is a pretty, pretty significant shift to this completely brand new world. And you dove in by flying to what the, the, the origin, the source of the beans and what, what were, what was it like getting it started? Like, I know there's probably a, a million components, but as you like thought about like that first year kind of getting things started, what were some of the critical path items, the critical things you had to do to make it what it is today? The first thing I had to do is figure out how to make chocolate. And that I could do at home. Then I did it in my law office, kitchen, paralegals, and administrative assistants helping me. And sort of beginning, not mastering, because I still haven't mastered it 12 years later. That's a myth. But to learn just the basics of making chocolate, that was hard. Then, to, and this is a very common thing in food, to translate making something in your kitchen to making it on a much larger scale is a real challenge. And especially when no one in the United States is doing it. Scharfenberger was the first. And the month that I incorporated, August 2005, they sold to Hershey. So nobody was doing it. There were two or three of us in the United States that started around the same time. And we weren't really talking with each other. The Europeans weren't sharing any of their secrets. And so that was a real technical and practical challenge. The second big one was finding farmers. And a, a real hallmark of our business is direct trading with cocoa farmers. And I had to find them. And back then, while you Google was around, you, you couldn't just Google cocoa farmers in fill in the blank country. And so the challenge of finding them was really, really steep at that time. It's still steep. I mean, this Sunday, I'll be leaving for my 41st origin trip visiting cocoa farmers. And so that was a really, really um, challenging and something I to this day don't take for granted. That is the relationship that I have with farmers and always on the lookout for another origin in case something happens with one of them in terms of safety and security or government price collapse or things like that. So those are two really big challenges. And one of the things, so you're you're doing like, I mean, import, export of consumables. And so I imagine there's like all sorts of regulations. Have those, I mean, you are a lawyer, that's probably helpful background to navigate that. But has that been difficult at all, especially since you have multiple origin, points of origin for your beans and, and where, where you're sourcing them from? The challenge of importing a, an agricultural raw material has been something that I, I didn't quite anticipate how challenging that would be. However, my law degree hasn't really helped me in that sense because I didn't do any kind of import export work, you know, unless somebody was killed mm -hmm. in the process or something like that. But I think having that sort of mind uh, where I could not be intimidated by contracts and words that I needed to look up and uh, terms of art in the shipping industry, that helped. But the thing that really, really helped was securing a freight forwarder in the United States, that is a person who understands the logistics of import of agricultural materials was really the linchpin for me. And I have actually been working with that firm now for 12 years. Wow. And they, so in the beginning, of course, I was very price sensitive to the, you know, like if I'm going to take a container from the Philippines where I'm going on Sunday, it's like, oh, I've got to get the most inexpensive price to get that container from point A to point B. Well, I learned pretty quickly that it's more important to have a solid relationship with that freight forwarder in the United States than it is to be super price sensitive about it because these containers that I have coming into our little factory in Springfield, Missouri are not from common um, export places, you know, like China or Europe, or these are from ports that these folks have never worked with, you know, the port of Davao in the Philippines or Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. And uh, so that it's been challenging, but I would say what, what's interesting about it is I've never purchased cocoa beans any other way. So what I mean by that is I don't even know a broker. If someone said, hey, I need something really quick and I need it in the United States now, I wouldn't know how to find it. The only way we've purchased beans is directly from farmers for 12 years. So in that sense, we've learned how to do it, but we're very careful about well, for example, right now, the government is shut down. The Federal Maritime Commission, I didn't even know there was such a thing. It's shut down. I can't get cocoa beans out of Ecuador right now. They're stuck. And that, that's really bad um, because I can't pay the farmers. I cannot make the final payment to the farmers. And so this is something that if I bought beans another way, I would not have to worry about this. But I love this part of it because it's challenging. It's interesting. It's exciting. And... I think that buying beans directly from farmers has uh, maybe the biggest impact on the quality of our chocolate than anything else we do. 
how did you establish those relationships with farmers to begin with? Like, who did you go to talk to? Like, that seems like, okay, I go to this country. It's like, where do you even begin? I built my career as a trial lawyer defending people accused of murder. Can you imagine finding witnesses in cases like that, especially high profile cases? Almost nobody wants to talk to me. Nobody. And so people, you know, may see me in the courtroom and think, oh, well, that's where the magic. No, the, the magic happens before the courtroom. That is the, the field work and the prep work. And that means finding people and talking to them and developing relationships such that they will trust you. It's like a journalist looking for people and, and developing a trust relationship. And that's exactly what I did. So I used those skills that I developed over a couple of decades of finding people and talking to them. And that has really served me well in searching for farmers. And it's the common thing of, I find somebody who knows somebody who knows someone and they know someone. And I finally get introduced to the right farmer group. It takes, in the beginning, it took me maybe two years or longer to develop one origin. Now uh, it, it can take me less time because I know what I'm looking for. And now that we have a reputation among farmers around the world, even though we're very small, they want to do business with us because they know that we pay more than almost anyone else they could ever find. Yeah. I mean, just the whole operation seems like extremely complex and it's like, and all these points of possible failure because of the nature of like the, the international aspect of it, the shipping aspect. I mean, you're connecting direct to the, the farmer. Like there's so many places where things could, could fall apart hypothetically on you. I mean, just even this, the fact that you brought this up right now, that the ports are restricted right yeah. now. So it's one of the things I love about it as an yeah. entrepreneur, and I'm sure you, your listeners can relate to this. I'm glad that I picked something, you know, 12 or 13 years ago that I would never fully master. And the, this is very common among entrepreneurs. We want to be challenged. It's almost a sickness among entrepreneurs. We like the edge of challenge. And man, I didn't know. I mean, I did pick this because I didn't ever want to be able to fully master it. And chocolate, just getting the cocoa beans here, as we've been discussing in the last few minutes, that is a big challenge. It is not going away. I don't care how, how long I've been in this business. I mean, for example, right now in the Philippines, where I'm going in a couple of days, there's a lot of unrest in the island that I go to related to remnants of Al Qaeda and ISIS. And I'm not, I don't want to over dramatize the situation, but I mean, they're on the same island that I'm going to, and it does present a security risk for me. Well, you know, I'm not being foolish in how I approach. I've been going there for 11 years, so I'm not foolish. And I don't, I'm very, very careful. But um, it's also exciting because I know I'm getting good beans. And I know that um, it will change. It could change by the time I'm there next week. And I, I like that. I like the challenge of this business. If I wanted to be bored, you know, then I could have picked something else. I think that's an interesting topic. You, you mentioned this idea that most entrepreneurs, like they want to be at that edge of challenge, like push to their extreme really, or push to that edge where the challenge is something that they can still overcome, but that still pushes them to their limits to some degree. And it sounds like that's what you've kind of found here. And I think that might be a, a segue into your book, Meaningful Work, because I think that challenge has something to do with meaning. But maybe you can riff on that and, and give me your take on it. I think absolutely this is a great segue to it because one of the other reasons why I like being on the edge of the edge of need is I've referred, I referenced a couple of times, you know, this is a small business. We only have 17 full-time employees. It's a family business. It's me and my daughter, Lauren, who was my co-author in the book. And we profit share with farmers and have since day one. And we are feeding a thousand kids a day now sustainably with no donations. We have a chocolate university program in which we engage local elementary, middle and high school students in our business. And then we take high school students every other year to Tanzania to meet cocoa farmers. All of this takes a lot of time. And some would say, well, this has nothing to do with chocolate. Why would you do this? Why would you profit share with farmers? You're already paying them a lot anyway. And it's because... This work is a vocation. It's a calling. And the calling is to make great tasting chocolate from beans that we buy directly from farmers. And the farmer aspect of this is almost sub vocation in order to make great chocolate. And so is working with students and engaging them in our business to let them know that small business can be force, a force for good in the world. So working with farmers and working with students are, in a sense, sub vocations to the vocation of making great chocolate because they support, they all support each other. 
working working with students is so fulfilling. I can't even. Well, I wrote a book about it, and and so is working with farmers. I love that and feel called to do it. And I believe that the activities that we undertake to work with farmers and to work with students directly impacts the quality of the chocolate that we make, which is to say who I am and who we are as a company is inseparable from the product that we make or the service we provide. And that's true for you, this podcast, it's, it is a fact. And then the last thing I would say about this is when I said living on the edge, I do. I've I've always been that way. And that's part of my personality. But another thing that relates to this is on the edge of, uh, I should say, financial uh, freedom or in other words, we make a profit modest. And as I said, we do a lot of other things with our money. But I like being in a place of need at this point in my life. I'm 57 years old. Uh, Back in the day, I made a lot of money. I put it all in this thing. And one of the reasons, and maybe the main reason I like being in need is because of my faith. And the the spiritual component of this business to me is very personal. And I like being dependent on something besides myself. And the something for me is my faith. And I want to be in that place. So that's where I am. How does someone get there though? I, f- I found this is like a, actually kind of a challenge, right? So we're kind of riffing on that idea of it's, you know, it's your faith. How do you implement that practically? You, you, with, for you, it was something about deciding this is your vocation, right? But maybe you can kind of give me some insights into that, how you, how you get there. Because I think there's a lot of people who have faith, but then struggle with like the day-to-day life and they don't see how they intersect or how they work together. Okay. For me, um, I'm a family brother at Assumption Abbey, which is a Trappist monastery in the Mark Twain National Forest, about an hour and a half from my home. And I've been a family brother for about five years. And I've been going to that abbey on retreat for about 15 years before that, uh, just as a guest. And so the way these monks, I'm not a monk, but I'm I'm just a lay family brother. I live with the monks when I'm there. I follow their schedule. I get up at 3.30 in the morning for the first prayer service. And it's a a combination of what they say of aura et labora, which is prayer and work. And so this informs a lot of my life and my business. The rule of Benedict is a 1500 year old, essentially management document that's been governing monasteries around the world for all these years. And so the beer that we love uh, brewed in a Trappist monastery in Europe is governed by this, this document. And so for me, it begins to answer your question, sorry, I'm taking so long, but it begins with a daily practice. And I have a sort of daily morning practice that kind of sets me right, you know, that that is designed to point me in the right direction for the day. And so I believe that one of the ways we can begin to incorporate our faith into our lives is to set it for the day and to have a practice, a discipline, if you will. And so I do that and I've done that for a long time. And then the other thing that I do is I try to have a discipline that will open me up. And by that, um, and you know from reading the book, that I believe we can find out who we are and we can begin to activate that, And meaning we can can have activities that express who we are when we're willing to explore our own broken hearts. And that's how I came to chocolate was by exploring this interior life of my of mine, which was very foreign to me because I was was and remain a type A, hard-charging, motivated, driven person. And that was foreign to me to have an interior life where I'm thinking about my own true self and who it is and how it can be expressed. And so the brokenheartedness aspect of is very important, I believe, into incorporating our faith into our daily life. Why? Because when our hearts are open, then we have the opportunity to see and hear the people around us who might need us and who we can then activate our faith by expressing kindness and compassion to them, as um, Pema Chodron would say, our shared humanity. It's not I'm the healer and they're the healed whether I'm with cocoa farmers or with children in remote Tanzania, it's a mutuality, it's kinship. And so we absolutely can find ways to demonstrate kindness and compassion as entrepreneurs, as people who run for-profit businesses, and it can 
fill our lives up day by day. And if we don't do this, if we don't offer our teams and ourselves this option of engagement in life-fulfilling work, then capitalism will dissolve as we know it. It already is. Yeah. Well, I th- yeah, I think you see that, right? Yeah. I, well, I think it was, was Tocqueville who spoke about that. And he, he, he talked about it in the context of democracy in America. But I also think he spoke about capitalism itself too. But just how e- either one of these taken off course without the, like, the moral man, the moral person can disintegrate, right? Yeah. So I think that's really interesting. I think what's what's particularly interesting about what you're saying too is it feels like something to me that you are that this is an idea that that people can find meaning where they're at. Yes. They can I suppose ascribe themselves a vocation where they're at even if they say are in one of those soul sucking jobs. Yes. Although although I arguably, you know, maybe some are make it more difficult than others. So I'm curious like with yours you were, you know, in law and probably dealing with some of the toughest types of cases you could as a lawyer that probably make you question humanity. Yes. And yet you were still able to keep kind of your mindset fixed on this goal. Had you were you already doing this kind of like morning practice? Was this already a part of what you did even as when you were in your your legal profession? It was during the transition phase. So that 5-year period that I spoke of in the beginning, it was during that period that I started developing this contemplative practice that that I mentioned, a prayer practice, meditation practice, and then I really have accentuated that over the last 17 years, but that I, I started it during that period. And that five-year period is where, as I said, I was just kind of aimless. I mean, I was so desperate, though, to find something. And you know, that's a great point that you made. We can be in a soul-sucking job and find vocation right where we are. I get emails from people around the country who say, you know, I've read your book. I love it. And you know what I realized? I realized that I'm in the right place. I'm where I need to be. Now, the soul-sucking part, though, can be a challenge. And the Buddhists talk about right work. And I think we need to ask ourselves that question. If we're fi- like in my in my, in my case, I believed I was doing right work. Yes, I was defending people accused of really terrible things, but it was in the cause of justice. But there are those who find themselves in a in a soul sucking job that may not be right work. And so I think it's a question that we need to really spend time with and ask ourselves in this introspection, this examination. And practice of develop of developing our interior lives is harder now than when I started doing it 17 years ago. And the reason it's harder is because there's more noise and we're we're really distracted. Very, you know, the, the paradox of choice is uh, before us in a way that we have never experienced, and that can be a curse and uh, a real challenge if we're not careful. And it will keep us from the development of this introspection and self discovery um, if we let it. That's an interesting question too. There, uh, interesting topic. The idea of of noise. I've been thinking about that a lot recently. I actually went on a five day silent retreat mm. um, earlier this year, and it was game changing for me. And it was just this, I guess, realization on my end that yeah, we are just inundated with noise, and just trying to be silent in our minds and hearts and just in our world, it's like almost impossibly hard in the modern world. Is that part of your practice, I suppose, as well? Like just like silence at all? Okay. It is, absolutely. And uh, silence and taking retreats, like you said, and taking retreats uh, alone, not with a group, I think is important. And we can do this, you know, very inexpensively. Um, It doesn't cost a lot. And I write about that a little bit in the book. I just wrote a blog post last week about it. I think, in fact, what happened to me is I was supposed to be at the Abbey a couple of weeks ago and my spiritual director, one of the monks there, called me and said, don't come. We all have the flu. You're going to get it. Don't. And I was like, oh man. So what I did, this is the first time I've done this. I basically created a retreat for myself, a one day retreat at my house. And I have a really small house. And my wife was really supportive of this. And it was cool. You know, I just, I did, I prepared some things for that day that would signal to my spirit. Okay. We're going to be in this, you know, just for a day. And it was you know, not like being at the monastery, but it was a facsimile of it. And I truly enjoyed it. And it cost me nothing, just a day. So I think, yes, I think it's it's important. And we must find a way to sort of unplug and it will help us focus. And I think it will give us clarity that we might not otherwise find. And for me, you know, I think clarity, it is... It can be when we're searching for our inspiration and passion and going to the next job. Clarity can be a real scarce commodity. 
And if we're not careful, and I find this from entrepreneurs who write me around the country, if we're not careful, we'll find a cool thing to jump to, but we'll be in the same boat that we were in, you know, two or three years ago before, because we haven't taken the time to really minimize the distractions, to silence the noise as best we can, and really go through some of the gut-wrenching work that will help us gain clarity to determine and discern, is this the thing for me? And that's hard. It's hard. Yeah, it's the the hard thing about hard things, right? Or I, I yeah. Jocko Willings on discipline, and uh, he's like, the thing about discipline is it's hard. <laughs> you know, I was like, yeah, I love that. it's a you know, it's that's surprisingly uh, useful to remember. It's like it's never discipline is not easy. It's you know, doing these meaningful doing meaningful work isn't easy. I'm not sure that it has to be, or even that it can be, um, if you're always pushing up against that point of of kind of maximizing or moving to your edge of what you're capable of and taking on the greatest challenge that you're capable of. I'm not sure that it can ever become easy but I, I think it can be rewarding. I don't know if you have any comments on that. Um, you mean moving to this? In terms, can, of, can be... in terms of like the difficulty of doing meaningful work and, yeah. and, oh, yeah, and the yeah. challenges that you'll face. I, I'm still, this is something I wrestle with and think about quite a bit. I'm like, should this be easier or is that you know, fake news? And, and what should I be thinking about? Should I be looking at how this... Because I know it can be rewarding, but like a lot of people do, I think they conflate... The challenge and with uh, and and the difficulty with, I don't know, like like how good it is. And so, if something's really difficult or really challenging, it's like they want to get away from it. Yeah. So, what are your thoughts on that? About well, I thank you for helping me understand the question. The most people suffer from the Tom Shoes syndrome, and like I wish the phrase social entrepreneurship was banished from the lexicon. Mm. And I, I don't like it. I feel like it's elitism. It divides us and it divides us small business people and big business people. And and we're the the people who are the so-called social entrepreneurs, they're, they're just doing the right thing in their communities and in their industries. And somehow this label has taken hold. And I, I do blame Tom's for a lot of it. And I think the other myth of this Tom Shoes thing is that Hey, we can do this really cool thing and we can get people to buy our products if we tell them we're going to be nice to other people. So we'll have one measure of nice if you buy our one measure of product. I don't like that. And my, we do not do that and we never will do that. And th that's why you'll see, I don't say on my website, buy a chocolate bar and I'll, you know, build, drill a water well or I'll build a preschool. We do all that stuff, but we do it because it's part of who we are and, and helping farmers facilitate their own vision of greatness. And let me focus on more directly on the answer to your question. And so when we suffer and labor under this myth of Tom's, then we think that we're going to have unbelievable profit margins when we do good. And you hear this thing about, you know, do good and do well. I don't buy that. And I, I, I do think it's fake news. And the reason why is be, for me, and now again, let me just say too, uh, let, let me give a caveat. This is just me. This is me. I, I am not a business school professor. I am not, I'm expressing my own personal experience that I believe that we, my company, we could be, we could have a more top line revenue. We could have greater profitability if my only focus was on the creating higher dollar value for the company and increasing my own value as a as the sole shareholder in the company. And if that was my only focus, if my focus was scale, I could do that. I could have more top line revenue. I could be more attractive to people who want to buy me and the rest would be history. But that is not my choice. I am making less money. In fact, I could just I've done this for 12 years. I could say I still have a law license that I keep active. I could go back to practicing law and within a month be making almost, well, within a year, I'd be making 10 times what I'm making now and what I have made for the last decade. But the reality is that I'm not the same person. And I, my vocation, my personal vocation is the transformation of my own heart. That's it, period. And I, my personal, my personal path toward that end is by staying a little bit lean and having a little bit of need myself mm. that then, so I'm not 
So I'm not laboring under this myth of how great I am and how independent I am and how self-made I am and how it's all going to be great. Because then from a spiritual and from a faith perspective, I begin to become untethered from this core part of myself. I've seen it. I've seen it happen in me. So I know this and I don't want it to happen again. And so in my 50s, you know, I've tried to make that tether as short as possible so that I I will be unlikely to either break the tether due to some temptation of scale or profit. And the more that I've practiced this, the more that I want it. And what I mean by that is there are times at work, not every day, not every month, but there are times when I have experienced the divine. Another way of saying it is that I, for a moment, have glimpsed heaven or what John O'Donohue calls eternal time. And I say to myself, when I reflect back on that, man, that was cool. I want to put myself in a position where I can experience that again. Why? Because it's part of my vocation. I want to transform me. And if I can do that, you know, then that's going to be my practice. And it's going to be my joy, knowing that it's going to come with some suffering. And it's going to, there's going to be some pain, but it's, it's worth it to me, at least yeah. today. <laughs> today. Yeah, well, uh, for you, it's a, it's a worthy sacrifice that you're making is, is what I'm Yeah. Doing. I mean, my roaster might break tomorrow. And when it does, I've had it for 12 years, it's going to be about 60 grand. Mm. Well, I don't really have 60,000 laying around right now. And that then if you if you had talked to me on the day when my roaster blows up, then I might have, might have right. a different answer. Right. But this is where I am today. Well, you mentioned one thing I thought would be a kind of a good good point to, to take us home to was the idea of scale. And in your book, you read about don't scale, reverse scale. So touched on it here briefly. Maybe you can expand on that topic. What do you mean by that? We are conditioned in this country, really North America and the West, to believe as entrepreneurs that our idea, whatever that may be, is only valuable if it's scalable. Because investors and venture capital people want to know, hey, can this scale? Because that then will give it worth Um, Chambers of Commerce want to know if it'll scale because it means jobs. Your friends and family want to know if it'll scale because it means you'll be rich. And so this is a siren song. And we've grown up with this. You and I and our colleagues have grown up with this understanding that scale equals value. And my challenge is, can we ask ourselves that if this idea that we have helps only one person, can it still be valuable? The answer to me is yes. What if it only helps me? then the answer is yes, it still can be valuable. And it's valuable for the reasons that we talked about in the answer to your last question, Mm -hmm. which is the value of not scaling. If is if we can maintain profitability and grow a little bit and not submit ourselves to this temptation of scale at all costs, then we can remain connected to all of the realities of life and we are, we're more closely connected to pain and suffering and relationship and sorrow. And that's where life is. That's where we have the greatest chance of seeing a signal that points us to home. Not if we scale, scale, scale. Because then we're, you know, we're, we're in this race to find the person who's going to do the thing that we were now, that we were doing before. And it's race, race as fast as we can. And we can't let anyone beat us at that. Uh, Otherwise, we'll lose. And we become distanced from others. And so I I, I think that this reverse scale is another way of saying human scale. Mm. And of course, there are exceptions to this. I mean, in the case of disaster relief and famine and malaria, and yes, we need scale. But I challenge entrepreneurs and, and people in business to just take a deep breath on the idea of scale and say, you know, is this something we have to do? And can we benefit by a practice, a discipline of reverse scale? Mm. Okay, so one one more question on this because I think that's really interesting. As far as the way you've organized your business and kind of moving forward, a lot of people in business do think about the exit. Uh, how do we how do we set ourselves up for the exit? And scale and exit kind of go hand in hand a little bit, right? It's like yes. scalable. We can show the numbers; they're compounding. Then we can sell for x x multiple, whatever. So with, with the way you've set this up, I know it's more of a, as a vocation. Do you have an exit plan? How do you think about that? Uh, is that? Or is that just a wrong framework to think about that question? I think it's a great question. And yes, I think about exit, but I don't know. 
And then that's not a great, I, I wish I had a really awesome soundbite for you. And so, and I have become content with the answer, I don't know. And it, it folds back into my faith. If I was faithful in the birth of this company, then I need to be faithful in the death of this company. I need to be faithful in the ending of this company. We have a problem with endings in this country yeah. and in the West. And I don't know how it'll end. It'll either end with me still in it and I'll be dead or it'll uh, go bankrupt or it'll something will happen to it or someone will buy it. Uh, I don't think my daughter will take it over, but she's working very close to me closely with me in it now. Maybe she will. I don't know. I, but to answer your question, yes, I think about it. I, it's not um, top of mind for me, but it is in my mind. But I'm going to be practicing the answer to that question by a willingness for it to have some degree of mystery in my life. And that is really tough for me. <laughs> it's hard. It's a challenge, but I'm going to, I'm going to let it, I'm going to let it be there. I, hey, I think it's as good a good an answer as any. I think it's it's challenging because you could say something definitive, and it's like there's still faith and hope that would go along with the definitive answer as well. But I think just being comfortable with what we're doing and knowing that it's, it's like one of the, these ideas that I've I've written about on my blog before. It's like stay the path, stay yeah. stay on you know stay on the path, and and if if you know that you initiated your project, your goal, that the journey you're on, if you just stay on it, there will be times where you will question what you're doing or you know, bad things will happen and you want to throw away the whole thing. But it's like, if you know that you initiated it in the right mindset, that you you, you propelled it forward in the right direction, there's a time, a time will come when it's worthwhile to just consider like just staying on the path, regardless of how hard it will be. And that takes faith and that takes fortitude. And it sounds like that's kind of your mindset on this and just like meaningful work in general. Right. Well, not, you know, not to, I know that, well, I, I would imagine that there would be a an analogy for your experience uh, on the battlefield. Mm. And and maybe you've written about it. I don't know. But I mean, there's a time I would imagine that we have to make a decision on the battlefield. This is not working. I'm going to go a different direction. And that takes a, gosh, that just takes this, I would think this just overwhelming amount of discernment and courage and understanding and willingness to listen to yourself and others and not a lot of time to do it. And then there's a time, as you describe, where I would imagine on the battlefield, we have to make this decision. Regardless, we are going forward. You know, we're going to continue on this path no matter what. Yep. That decision point, I think, is that place, that moment is it's where every it's where it all resides. You know, it's it's uh, there's a lot happening there in that moment, in that decision, in that discernment and wisdom. And I mean, gosh, you could teach it whole, you know, month long seminars on just that. <laughs> yeah. Just, just having the confidence to say, okay, I, you know, I've discerned this and I'm, I'm going forward or I have discerned this and this is not this, I need to turn around. I need to go a different way. That's, that is, that's huge. It is. I would say that like, if, if you were to uh, summarize it or, or condense it, it like that, I'd say that is one of the core challenges that faces everyone no matter what, not necessarily all the time, but everybody will face that you probably multiple times throughout their lives, right? It's this idea of like, what's what's the path? Is it forward? Is it is it shifting directions? Is it changing the work I'm doing? Is it you know, what is it? And that idea of discernment, but I think it I think you need to have some foundation, right for it to be able to discern properly, you have to have some foundation of what's your compass, what's your map? Where are you pointing at? in the first place to be able to discern. I think that's where a lot of people get lost in the discernment process or, or cho choice making processes. If you don't have some foundation, how do you make the right choice? And so it's just like almost like going down a rabbit hole if you don't have, if you haven't established these are the fundamentals, which I know your book, Meaningful Work, uh, kind of lays those out, at least how, how you've approached that. So what I want to do is for those who are listening, check out Meaningful Work. You can just search Meaningful Work or go to Amazon, search Meaningful Work. Um, I want also, want everybody to also check out askanozi.com. That's, let me see if I could spell that out for everybody here who's listening. That's going to be A S K. So ask I N O S I E.com. And that's your chocolate uh, company's website where people can order, I believe, online. And they can also find your stuff at Whole Foods and a bunch of other places, right? Right. There's a zip code locator on our website too. So we sell to a lot of small specialty food stores around the country. I love it. And I guess I just want to say thank you so much, John. It was a really interesting conversation here. I find these kind of deeper questions, uh, well, more meaningful too, myself. So I appreciate you being willing to kind of, you know, 
tackle some of these questions for us and kind of just give us some insights into how you do business and what, what you're all about. So thank you for being on In the Trenches, man. It was a real pleasure. Well, thank you. Thank you for the questions and thank you for doing what you do. Of course. Are you trying to grow your online business, but struggling to get new customers consistently and predictably? Are you tired of working nonstop only to see your income plateau? Are you ready to step off the hustle hamster wheel, as I call it, and step onto a path of predictable profit that you can scale as much or as little as you want? Don't worry, you're not alone. I've been there. When I first got started, I didn't have a clue what I was doing. So I started reading blogs and listening to podcasts by people I respected and wanted to learn from. I slowly but surely put their recommendations into practice. But because I wanted to do it all myself, maybe you, you're you something like that, right? And you love to do, do it by yourself, learn through trial and error. Well, bottom line is it took forever. Results were unpredictable when I was first getting started. I wasn't sure where to spend my time, money, and energy. And shiny penny syndrome got the best of me on more than one occasion. For many entrepreneurs, the amount I sacrificed, working literally nonstop in some cases in my spare time, and 12 and 14 hour days routinely after going full time, combined with the endless fog of war, aka that uncertainty that I had to deal with at all times because I was going it alone. I think that would have been enough for most entrepreneurs to throw in the towel. But I was persistent, focused, and I stayed humble. Day after day, I worked to grow the traffic to my website, increase my list of subscribers, and generate a healthy living for my ebooks, e courses, and other digital products. At least that was the goal. But maybe more important than the work, was that I paid attention to what I was doing, including what worked and what didn't. Eventually, I discovered a predictable pattern of growth. And so what I did was I just doubled down on those things, and I scrapped or sidelined the other things that weren't working so well. Finally, two years after resigning my commission as a captain in the army and going full-time on my online business front with my blog, with my podcast, etc., I replaced my income with digital product income. Two years. And so if that's where it stopped, I would have been happy with it. I would have been happy with the results. I wouldn't have complained. I would have been very content just replacing my income. But the bottom line is it was so much work. I wanted to you know, see if it could go somewhere else, right? So I just kept doing what I was doing, but better, faster, and more effectively. Again, just kind of applying the same system that I discovered uh, from seeing these patterns emerge, right? So I implemented it. I kept doing it. And eventually replacing my income turned into doubling my income. And then that turned into a little bit more and a little bit more. But not just that, it afforded me the freedom to dictate my day and also choose the projects I want to work on, on the schedule and on the timeline I want, and to work with the people I want to work with. And to me, that's like a whole new level of freedom, especially coming from the military. It's something I've never really had that level of complete autonomy until I became my own boss. I started my own business. And until ultimately, until it became profitable enough for me to start to take a step back and actually reap the rewards of it. Because it's not all just working, working, working. And I do believe it's hard work. And I'll always say that nothing about doing this stuff is easy. But at the same time, you've got to reap the rewards at some point and take some of that profit, uh, even if you're just reinvesting it into new assets and things like that. Bottom line is, it can't just be work, right? Entrepreneurship and business is about that result that occurs, the value you've created and the profit that that piece of value that you've captured, okay? And you want to be able to reap the rewards of that profit, of that value, that little sliver of value that you get to capture, that you get to net, right? You want to be able to take advantage of that. Otherwise, you know, the entrepreneurship game really does become just a grind. And and for, I think, a lot of entrepreneurs, unfortunately, it becomes meaningless, and that's when they quit. Well, for me, I love this stuff. I really, truly do. I mean, it is my thing. And so that's why I didn't just stop where I was at. I've stayed committed to learning everything I can about all aspects of this online business world and this online marketing world. And I do this through real world application. In other words, I'm currently growing several online businesses and I'm always putting my ideas to the test in real time with my own money, with my own time and energy, oftentimes with employees, you know, a lot of some, some stuff more advanced, some stuff more simple, but you know, so varying levels of complexity and again, in different spaces, different niches. And I can say, you know, bottom line, I've always loved the startup hustle, but I got to say, it's nice to now be in a position where I can get big results with much less effort, thanks to having built the foundation of my business the right way. And again, I did it all through trial and error, but I don't think that that's the way that everyone needs to do it. And in fact, looking back on it, if I had to redo it, I don't know if I would. It was so difficult to just go it alone and try to figure everything out by myself. So one of the things I've tried to do is give back with this podcast, with my blog, and with my newsletter. 
But maybe even more rewarding than any of this stuff, while I've enjoyed all of it, I think the thing that I'm enjoying the most, that I find most engaging and rewarding is the premium business mastermind and coaching program I run called 100K Academy. Inside 100K Academy, I help ambitious entrepreneurs who are very driven and excited to be doing what they're doing. I help them grow their reach, their influence, and their profit using my proprietary marketing system. That's the same one I use to scale my own online businesses from zero to multiple six figures and beyond. And the same system I use to help my clients reach the New York Times, Wall Street Journal bestseller list, set Kickstarter funding records, and create viral product launches that have turned into predictable revenue streams. So lots and lots of case studies that you can find at tommorcus.com. If you're curious, just go to tommorcus.com slash about, and that'll get you started. Most importantly, this system is one that 100K Academy members and alumni have used to achieve tremendous results, like Alexa, who used it to have her most profitable year ever, or Tina, who used it to make five figures from a sales funnel that she can now replicate and scale, and that's exactly what she's doing, or Carrie, who made over $75,000 in just seven days. And the crazy part about his story was that his online business was actually a side hustle up until that first profitable launch, which he has then been able to grow and scale. And he subsequently quit his job following that very successful week. And I think that that has been just a game changer for Kerry and the life he's living and the work he gets to do and the impact he gets to make on the world because of the great work he's doing now, because he was able to figure out a system that would get him the targeted traffic, the subscribers, the sales to grow a profitable online business. Bottom line, if you want to grow your online business from six to seven figures, but you flatlined or you're struggling, or you just want to be told what to do and when to do it and in what order, right? And you want a system that is predictable and scalable and isn't just you know another shiny penny, but actually will fit right into your business. It plugs in and is something that you can truly grow. I want you to go to tommorcus.com slash academy. That's tommorcus.com slash academy. Academy is spelled A-C-A-D-E-M-Y. Go to tommorcus.com slash academy, and you'll find a page on my website with more details about 100K Academy, the business mastermind coaching program I run, as well as instructions on what to do next. Again, that's tommorcus.com slash academy. And if you're serious about growing your reach, influence, or profit, just follow the instructions and we'll be in touch, okay? Again, tommorcus.com slash academy. Go ahead and head over there now. 